Hey everyone, you are listening to another episode of the All Things Private Practice podcast coming to you live today from Asheville, North Carolina. And I am joined today by good friend and colleague Joe Muirhead out in Australia, where it is like 8 a.m., 9 a.m. I can't do the math. It's 6 p.m. in Eastern <laughs> time. So uh, she, <laughs> it, that's the kind of day it's been for me. Uh-huh. Joe's just starting her day. She's got her like drink good coffee before you start the day shirt on, which I love. <laughs> And Joe is a counselor in Australia, a business coach, an author, a speaker, a cricket fan extraordinaire, a good coffee snob, which I love too. And I'm just really happy to have you here. Uh, Thank you. Thank you, Patrick. The coffee snob is possibly the thing that needs to go first on my list. Yeah. Yeah. We could just have an episode about why you should drink good coffee and support small business and we can just nix all the other conversation and I'd be totally happy with that. I think it's it's an important conversation because how many times in, in Facebook therapist communities do we see the question, what coffee machine or should I even have a coffee machine in in my waiting area? So I I actually feel like it's relevant. (laughs) I think it's relevant as hell. And I think also, I I don't want to go down this rabbit hole because I will, but when it's like, you know, Starbucks, 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 and I'm not trying to knock any Starbucks Mm -hmm. fans out there that are listening, but like, if you own a small business, you should probably try to support small business. That's just my uh, plug right there. And Anyway, we have no topic scheduled for today. We're just going to see where this goes because Joe has such a wonderful personality and story. And Joe, you told me the last time we connected where you were like, I'm kind of a fan of yours. And that made me, one, unbelievably uncomfortable and bashful. And like, I just was like, holy shit, that feels amazing because I follow all of your stuff. And I never thought that we would have a friendship, let alone like being able to sit here and record a podcast together. And that just means a lot to me. Oh, thank you. But and and I am so uh, some some history to that, Patrick. Is there, there's I, I had I feel like the last couple of years have been a bit strange. Um, and I had the uh, now upon reflection the opportunity to sit back and observe behaviour more than participate in the world. And one of the things I noticed over the last couple of years was every five minutes or basically every time I opened Facebook, it felt like there was more people claiming to be the next best business coach for health professionals starting out. And having done this work now, I'm into my 12th year, I've seen that the rise of those tides before. And some people last a day, some people last a week, some people last a couple of years. And I'm, I'm I'm starting to get okay at picking picking where energy is going to flow. And I remember looking at your stuff and going, ah, there's something different here and started watching what you were doing and how you were serving people. And I went, he gets it. He actually gets what's going on and how health professionals need to be supported. And then I've just watched you go from strength to strength. So there's there's quite a few of us who are like on the Patrick bandwagon. <laughs> And the other reason for that too is, you know, we need to pass the baton on. I've been doing this for a while. I worked out this week (laughs) that I have been in my profession for 30 years. I seriously have become that person where I go, oh my God, I'm old. Like (laughs) like I I have a lot of wisdom. That's why my hair is white. um, and, And we need to be passing the baton on to people who have new ideas and new energy and new ways of thinking because people of my generation, we've gotten us this far. And we actually need people with new ideas, new ways of thinking uh, to, to take that baton and help add to the body of knowledge. And that that is a really big part of my messaging is I am so freaking sick and tired of us talking about theories and um, methods of doing things that date back to World War I. So... As an example, I'm a rehabilitation counsellor. Rehabilitation counselling was a profession that was developed after World War I because we had returning service personnel coming back, not dead, but incredibly maimed, um, and they they needed some pathway to reintegrate back into life. We are still using the same biopsychosocial model of rehabilitation and community integration that was developed in World War I. And I just think, no, I'm not saying it's bad. Maybe it's the most awesome thing and we won't ever find. It's the greatest of all time. We won't ever find another thing. But 
wouldn't it be nice if we as a profession had the time, energy and financial resources to sit down and actually explore whether there might be something better now? That's a hell of an idea. (laughs) (laughs) I feel like I'm going to have a hard time controlling my laughter during this episode. Mm -hmm. So everyone listening, Mm -hmm. this is just a real conversation and that's what I want this to be. So one, Mm -hmm. I want to just say thank you because I really appreciate that. And Maybe one day I will also get on the Patrick bandwagon. But right now, that's still a work in progress. <laughs> but, the seats you called are really me out on that the other cause... day. You were like, <laughs> yeah. But, you know, it's um, that's such a good point because that feels so archaic, right? Like, not only, like you're saying, we need new faces, we need new energy um, coming into the field, not just of mental health and, and private practice care and therapy, but in entrepreneurial ship and coaching, because I think we either evolve or we kind of stay stagnant and that doesn't serve us as we change, as our culture changes. And you're right, like a a modality or a a mentality from World War One, right? That's so, that's interesting to take in and realizing like that was 80 fucking years ago. Like that was a very long time ago and we haven't really shifted. We have a situation in the United States that's developing with council pact um, with counselors trying to unify so that we can work across state lines with clients who maybe they go home for college, maybe they just move out of state, but we have a rapport and the fact that we're not licensed in those areas, that's really damaging to therapeutic alliance and relationship. And we still have people combating the notion that that should happen because it's not fair to them being licensed in one state. I'm not going to go down that road right now, but that's my newest gripe looking at that at my Facebook group right now. <laughs> um, But you kind of are one of those pioneers, Joe, and one of the people who really started to work on this like entrepreneurial mindset coaching, especially with therapists. And I was amazed that most of this started in the United States, right? You didn't really start this in Australia. No, no, I didn't. So to, to give people some context, the population of Australia is less than the population of California. Okay, so we need we need to have that there as well. So uh, in Australia, we have a much more socialized public health service than you do in the US. It is not evil. It is not bad. It just is. Just putting that out there. Um, and, and so we, we similarly to the US, we have private, we have public, uh, and, and then we have this thing where we try and do both at the same time. No, one isn't better than the other. We all have privilege. It's, it, I'm not here to denote, to, to denote that. What I find interesting, though, is in the USA, your your nation was founded by people wanting to leave the regulations of Great Britain and come and start a new world. Um, So it was all about personal choice. It was all about the entrepreneurial spirit. We're going somewhere to start something new, to create the life that we want to live, that we can't have here in Great Britain because... Well, actually, it came out of banks and finance. Does that surprise anybody? Um, but <laughs> let's say if you've spent any time in London, it rains a lot. You think you get seasonal affective disorder in parts of the US? I'm thinking London's probably got the you know 10 out of 10 on that. So your nation was founded. And yeah, there's been horrible things happen there, but your nation was founded. Um, and and that's you know, that, that's the spirit of how it, it was started and created. Here in Australia, my people came from Great Britain on convict ships. Quite literally, that is my, that is where my genealogy goes. We can, I, we, I had family come out on either the first or the second fleet. We can't tell because nobody kept records on prisoners who were dying in those great big ships. Uh, we do understand there was a loaf of bread involved. How that got passed down the line, I don't know. So here in Australia, I we, I didn't have the population of people to start with. So I, I'm quite opinionated. I And those opinions are generally founded on me having done the thinking, done the work. I'm always more than happy to have somebody disagree with me, just do it kindly and politely. Uh, so here in Australia, I just I didn't quite have that same voice. Um, because I was starting to say things like private practice has a very real place in our healthcare. And people were like, shut up. No, you can't say that. Private practice is all about people who just want to make money off sick people. And I'm like, private practice has a genuine place in reducing the burden off the public health system. 
And I believe that with every fibre of my being. I be- private practice just works. It works for the clinician who wants to do the, this type of work. It works for the clients who can access this type of work. And it works for our government funded services because then we're removing the burden of, so in Australia, 27 million people all needing treatment by, you know, a few, a handful of people in our health services. Like here in Australia at the moment, to access community care, people are waiting 9, 12, 18 months. So if if you can picture yourself in pain, so if you've, you've got a really bad back and your back is so, so sore, and if you've lived with chronic pain for any length of time, you know that's, that's debilitating. And you've been told you don't need surgery, but you need physical therapy. So you go, right. So you limp on down to the physical therapy department and put your name on a waiting list. And they say, we have a waiting list of about 18 months. We'll let you know when you're close to the top. All right. Or you can go, excellent. Who do I know who knows a physical therapist in my local community who is going to get this pain resolved? Yeah. So that's, that's, I see the same thing for mental health professionals. Now, I used a, a physical example because I think with mental health professionals, we get so used to hearing ourselves in these stories that w- they lose some of their impact. Um, but I, I know anyone who's lived with pain, we just don't think about putting our hand in our pocket to go and get that pain resolved. So the same thing is happening with mental health services. I, I, it, it hurts my heart that somebody has finally gone, I need help. My anxiety, I now understand I've got anxiety, it is out of control. I'm about to lose my job. I can't stay at home anymore. I'm sick of not being able to sleep. Could somebody please help me? And the automated response they get from a health service is you're on our list, somebody will be in touch. So for me, starting this coaching, it it was about giving health professionals some respect and dignity because I think that that was sorely missing for me. But it was also understanding that we can bridge a really big need. And it's private practice isn't for everyone. I've never said that it was. But it certainly is an important part of our health system. So for me, being able to speak like that in Australia wasn't, uh, wasn't well received. So I had the, um, I was working with another a coach and got to meet Kelly and Miranda for Zinni, from Zinnime. I didn't know that this health coaching thing was even a thing. So here I am meeting these other two people who were trying to do the same thing I was doing. And we were like <laughs> sponges. Oh my God, this is so awesome. You're just like me. And it was just exciting. And they were incredibly generous. And I've enjoyed watching the way they have developed their services and what they offer in the the gifts they've been to the therapist community in the USA. And they asked me to come and speak at at a conference called the Most Awesome Conference. And seriously, to this day, it is still the most awesome conference I've ever been to. And um, it was there that I got to speak what I thought to be true. And it was just well received. And that was back in 2015. So I've been doing the work for a while, back in 2015. And from then, the people in the US are like, Joe, you're a straight shooter. You tell us how it is. Um, you're not going to blow smoke, um, but you're also smart and can help me work out why I'm getting in my own way and what are the things I need to do to fix that. So that, that's how my entry into the USA came about. So there you go. History lesson in the making. <laughs> It's a that's a pretty remarkable story and starting mm-hmm. point and also such a good way to reframe it too. I think when we use the examples of physical pain, it's a lot easier to conceptualize, right? Because there's yes. still that shame and stigma that comes up with mental health support. And then mm. culturally as a profession, there's a shame and stigma that comes up when we think about charging clients for mental health support. Yes. So big cultural shift happening in the States right now with a new era of psychotherapy and more of the realization that like, it's absolutely okay to make money and help people simultaneously. And both things Mm -hmm. can be done. And Mm -hmm. you're still going to get those reactions where it's like, no, that's being greedy. You're taking advantage of people. And that's okay for those people who think that way. Maybe you're in private practice and you're, you have your own model and that works for you, or you're going to stay in community mental health and that works for you. And that is okay. However, I want to challenge the notion, right? That exists of You can't do both. And I think most of the time it is mindset based where it's like, Mm. 
one, I don't know how to own a business because grad school didn't fucking teach us anything. Two, I don't understand why I'm getting in my own way, why these feelings, why mm. these emotions are surfacing when I'm starting to do these mm. things like imposter syndrome, insecurity, comparison mindset stuff, right? I see you post about comparison mindset all the time. And that is really real. Like on the outside looking in, everything's shiny, everything's perfect, everything's glamorous. And on the other side of being an entrepreneur, it's fucking messy. And there's a oh. lot of heartache and there's a lot of pain. Yeah, it, 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 and you're absolutely right. Because being a clinician and being an entrepreneur are almost diametrically opposed to each other in terms of mindset. So in my book, oh, <laughs> I have a model <laughs> where I actually explored um, the difference between entrepreneurial thinking and clinical thinking. So, and, and you can actually see it this visually in front of you. And this is so eye-opening to so many people because as health professionals, we are risk adverse. There's the first thing that I come up with all the time. We are always looking for a safe way for somebody to take a risk. That's what we're doing with clients. We want to make it safe for you to step outside your front door. We want to make it safe for you to feel confident to have that uncomfortable conversation. We want you to feel safe enough to practice your breathing or go to an EMDR session or talk about the fact that you've had nightmares for 20 years. Uh, so we're always looking to help people manage risk. Then on top of that, we have all this compliant driven, compliance-driven risk management. What license have you got? Where can you practice? Don't cross state lines. Make sure you're not doing anything out of your scope of practice. Don't call yourself a coach if you're going to do therapy. Don't call yourself a therapist if you're going to be doing coaching. Where, which insurance do you have? Which bank account do you have? Like, seriously, and, and, and then we throw words around like, that's unethical, that's unprofessional. The latest one I'm seeing is that's immoral. And we throw this stuff around. So we get, end up with, like, we're risk adverse. We don't want to go first. We, because nobody's done it before and my peers are going to crucify me if I do something a little different, if I try something new that hasn't been tested and there's no randomised controlled trial over the last 20 years. Sorry, segue. If you're waiting for a 20-year randomised controlled trial, your ideas are now outdated. Yes. Okay. Yes. So, <laughs> Coming back, I know enough about research to know that that's truth. So we're risk adverse in our therapeutic approach, but as an entrepreneur, we have to be risk ready. You have to understand your tolerance to risk as well, but you have to be risk ready. You have to be ready to go, I'm going to put myself out there and I'm going to do everything within my power to make sure that the right people find me so that I can provide them the right services at the right time, but there's no guarantee, right? The other thing that we are awesome at doing as health professionals, and this comes in from our training, but it also is a part of what makes us a health professional in the first place, is we are here to serve. We are here to serve. I do, nobody decides to go to grad school or, in my case, to university to become a health professional because their first thought is it's going to make me rich. There's right? almost that running joke in grad school and university that it's the exact opposite that yeah. you don't get into this profession to make money. Yeah. And then you, there are schools, of social work schools that I have had arguments with that are actually teaching newly graduate, newly minted social workers that if a person is in need, if they can't afford to pay, you provide them services anyway. But you basically need to martyr yourself. And that's, that's just really further helpful. conditions and, and just reinforces that belief of I have to give all of myself away to be in this profession. And the way that I'm paying myself back is the currency of emotional labor. And in mm -hmm. reality, you can't pay your fucking bills with emotional labor and you can't keep the lights on in your office with that. And you can't prevent yourself from burning out by taking on every single person that calls you. It's just not humanly possible. It, it is not humanly possible. So we, we, we can't, we cannot con continue. I don't care where you're employed, private practice, so socialized uh, healthcare, where it, community mental health. We, we can no longer tolerate being widgets, right? Um, so coming back to the mindset shift that we need to make, we are taught that money is evil. We, we, and, and a lot of us come from a, a pseudo-Christian or a Judeo-Christian background where, you know, unfortunately that, that concept has been bastardized. 
but we are taught that, that money is evil, where entrepreneurs know that money is a resource. It allows me to do more things to help more people. It allows me to look after myself in such a way that I can be helping more people. It allows me to plan for my future, for my retirement. It allows me so that I am not a burden, so that I have the choices that I want to have. Like any other profession in the world talks about this, except health. Medicos will talk about this, especially mental health especially mental health. So it excites me now when I have people coming to me going, Joe, I need to get prepared for my retirement. Now, I would prefer people started doing this when they were in their 30s, not when they are 65, but we need to start somewhere. So we can start putting together a way of working that allows you to stay the course, last the distance, feel good about you doing, but know that your future is secure. Because I think if anything else in the last couple of years, even if you've got a full-time permanent job with a large organisation, there was no security in employment. None. None. And no expectation that that would change in a matter of a week or a day. And mm-hmm. so many people scrambling to figure it out. Yeah. And we haven't, I wasn't around when the Spanish flu was around. So I never lived through a global pandemic before. So I was learning on the run like everyone else. But that that, that just spoke, because I, I ended up being such a poor fit for employment. I, I thought that that was all I could do. I grew up in a household where my father was self-employed. I watched him have a heart attack at age 37 due to the stress of that, right? So my mind shift or mindset was self-employment makes you sick. Self-employment gives you a heart attack. I was never going to do that. But, you know, into my career, I was managing and leading organisations and burning out. I was doing lots of really good clinical work and I was burning out. And, And it wasn't until I took control of my work life that I was able to go, huh, private practice is the best way for me to look after myself. Now, that doesn't happen from day one. (laughs) <laughs> just that's a process but it has been and I wouldn't I wouldn't exchange it for anything I if, if I couldn't be a health professional anymore I would find another way of being employed or, or generating income without having to be employed somewhere it, it, I'm just not a good fit for it so some there there are a couple of differences between clinical thinking and entrepreneurial thinking agreed and I I wouldn't even try to say it better myself and I'm laughing right now because you're mentioning not being able to be employed. And I was talking with someone earlier about, I was never manageable. Like once I realized that there was too much bullshit involved with like a punch the clock nine to five situation, right? Like if I get my job done in three days, why do I have to be here these other two days? Like, I don't understand, make it make sense for me. And I was always in middle management and leadership. And Mm -hmm. I'm sure people above me hated that. That was like, I don't understand why we can't do things this way or work this way. So I think for Me, I could never go back to that lifestyle either. And I want to circle back to something you mentioned that really struck a chord with me, like the realization of you can do this work and you can help so many people by preventing yourself from burning out. So for me, no longer working as a therapist, I have about three or four clients left and that's that's about all I'll ever take again. When I'm doing my practice building programs with eight to 10 therapists from all over the country, helping them build their businesses, helping them work for themselves, then they get to help those 25 to 30 people on their caseload. And that trickles down and that trickles down and that helps the community at large. So if we start to realize, like once we get out of the one-on-one therapy world, if we want to, you can still help massive amounts of human beings by doing different types of work because our skills are so applicable as mental health professionals in so many different ways. If we can just understand how often they can be used in entrepreneurship, in leadership roles, et cetera, and it doesn't have to look a certain way. Agreed. Uh, oh, wow. That, and it doesn't have to, it doesn't mean that everybody who has had a private practice for 20 minutes should become a practice building coach because this comes, this type of work comes with its own challenges and you'll get caught out if you're if you haven't invested in doing your own work um, in terms of addressing your own mindset and addressing 
uh, becoming skilled in things like markets, everybody needs to learn how to market. Or, or, you know, you don't want to call yourself a marketing coach, but you end up talking to people about marketing. Um, but it's it's bigger than that. It's, it really is this mindset piece. And I, I have never tried to sell my services on mindset because people often don't want to buy mindset. They want to buy the result. So my process is let me help you transform your business so you're working in a way that nourishes you and adds to the body of knowledge um, where you're earning the type of income that you want to earn. And I'll, I, I, the way I do that actually is irrelevant. But you know what? <laughs> I, I'm going to do it by working on your mindset. But I'm not going to tell you that because you won't want to work with me. Right. Because the con <laughs> misconception is going to be that Joe is a life coach. And no offense to any good life coaches out there, but there's a big stigma. And understandably so. Um, but mm -hmm. if you're selling mindset, right, which is always when I come back to what do I actually do? Because it's so much mm. bigger than just like, I'll help you start a practice step by step. Like anybody mm. can Google how to get a fucking employee identification number and like set up a bank account. But at the same time, it's not about the setup process. Mm. It's the fear, the anxiety, the insecurity of mm. the I don't know what I don't know. And that terrifies mm. me. And then the concern of can I really make this a successful venture if I'm doubting myself so often? And how do I put that into words though? How do I sell that, right? And that exactly like you're saying is just packaging it differently, but understanding we're gonna get to your desired result because it is mindset shifting and mindset work. And I think good coaching is all about someone who has done the work, like you said, yeah. like you have to be able to show up and get into the thick of it and know what it's like to have struggled and second guess it, second guess it, doubted yourself and, you know, question your abilities because otherwise, how can you show up authentically for someone who's doing the same thing? In particular, yes, applause. <laughs> and <laughs> health professionals are smart. They see right through it. They, if you are not, if you are not genuine, if you do not have a genuine solution to a genuine problem, you will get caught out. Like, and because we're smart and, and we're skeptical because we, we are always looking for that the true currency of our work is trust. It is not the exchange of income. It is trust. Before a person opens themselves up to you as a clinician, they trust you. I had this I had a, a, a consultation with an eye surgeon this week um, and he told he, he met me he was in a rush because he's always in a rush and he was walking in the room as he was inviting me in the room he pointed to a chair he sat on the chair and as I was sitting on the chair he was walking in my personal space all right I actually put my hands up like a big stop sign and said before you get closer please explain to me what you're about to do so he was so caught up in his process he'd forgotten so I have no doubt that he's an excellent surgeon can't re cannot remember why I was started to talk about that anywho coming back help me reorientate myself Patrick what were we talking about Ooh, well we're talking about now. skepticism and trust ah, trust so I didn't trust him I did not trust him even though I've seen him before even though he's got all these letters after his name it took me eight months to get in to see this guy so all the things were telling me he was an expert never try and sell me on your expertise don't really care but he he invaded me sorry <laughs> He invaded me and, and trust got broken. So if you're wanting to work as a coach or a consultant or a mentor and you, you kind of, it, it's not about the imposter syndrome because that's a whole different thing. But if you genuinely don't have anything to offer, please don't do it because you're going to get caught out. There you go. That, that's the simple yes. thing. Um, and you don't all have to, if you want to get into this work, great, because we need you. But get into it not because you're so sick of therapy or as a way of getting over state lines, because to me that's you're you're, you're that's, you're not you don't even understand the, the nature of the issue if that is your whole reason for getting into co coaching. Um, but but yeah, that trying to work out how do I make this decision in a way that doesn't make me want to vomit, in a way that puts food on the table in a way that I've got some peace of mind that knowing in three months' time when my cash reserves run out that I'm going to be okay. That, that's why people need you and I. 
And I'm not here just to go pat you on the back, Patrick, it's all going to be okay. It's all be okay. If you just believe it, if you act, affirm it, if you do three hours of meditation every morning, go for your jog, then do some yoga and write it out a thousand times that you are successful, you, you actually need to have people like Patrick or myself in your life that are actually asking the difficult questions, which is, what are you doing to attract the types of clients that you want to work with? I'm Absolutely. saying I'm saying my affirmations. What are you doing to attract the type? I have a psychology today profile. Fantastic. Can we have a look at it? Sure. I am a therapist. I work in Florida. I charge $150 a session. You don't have a social, uh, you don't have a psychology today profile. Okay, you're laughing. <laughs> Do I need to shut up now? <laughs> No, I, I'm laughing because you chair. are so spot on. I'm laughing because everything you're saying is so spot on. And I'm sorry, I'm not trying to make you stop talking because I think what you're saying is so valuable. I am thinking of a legitimate <laughs> comparison right now because I taught a course on how to market and attract your clients and be authentic and write your content and all this shit. But I was using profiles on Psychology Today from therapists in Florida because I was in Florida at the time. And they were so fucking bad. Like I was just randomly Googling therapists near me in St. Pete. And the, I clicked on the first one in front of the group of therapists who was taking my stuff and we're implementing what we're talking about, right? And I click on the first one the first one and i start laughing because it is so bad like the picture is so off putting the verbiage is so bad it's all about proving your competency it's like a resume as if i'm trying to sell the client on how many years how many licenses how many trainings i've gone to and the client is like who the fuck is this person talking to i know it's not me <laughs> and it was just such a great example of what not to do but again a psych today page is just one small piece of the puzzle and like, you have to be putting these things in place. And it's not just simply like manifesting it. It is actually understanding the strategy behind it because psychology and marketing go hand in hand. And if you can't conceptualize that or make sense of that, maybe you don't need to be a business owner because you have to understand how to market and network. And most often in my programs, people, I'm sure you experience this too. You talk about marketing and networking. And the instinct and the reaction is like, ooh, that's sleazy. Yes. That's gross. That makes me feel like a used car salesperson. And it's like, mm -hmm. no, we know how to build relationships. That's what we mm -hmm. do. Mm -hmm. Use your fucking skills so that people know that you exist. Mm -hmm. Oh, yeah. So then, Patrick, what gets in the way of that? Because it's not a skills development problem. We already have the skills. What gets in the way? I don't like it. I don't want to feel like a used car salesman. What if people reject me? What if this doesn't work? What if I fail? And for me, the sense of failure very quickly goes, I fail, everybody leaves me, I am completely alone and abandoned, I have no way of supporting myself, I am a crack whore on the street. Like that, that conversation happens in my head instantaneously. And yes, I do use quite flamboyant language because I need people to wake up, right? Okay. Yes. But so I don't, I don't even have those words or I've just had to learn how to backtrack through that conversation because when I have to put myself out there and do something new, I get up, I get nervous. I'm like, who's going to reject me now? What sort of hate am I going to get now? Who's going to accuse me of doing something bad now? I am more scared of my peers than I am of my potential clients. Absolutely. And Seth, Seth Godden said that first, and he is 100% right, but we're not marketing to our peers. And if we're genuine in our desire to help people, most of us went into health professional schools to learn how to help people, but we're happy to help them when they've already found their way into our room. Right. That is selfish <laughs> and it breaks all of the rules and intent of what we profess to be about, which is accessibility. If people cannot find you, they don't know you can help them. So that is your on. first role as a therapist or a health professional. And yes, I'm cranky and I've got my angry mum voice on. <laughs> <laughs> I... I... <laughs> 
if I wasn't enjoying this conversation so much, I would just be like, that's it. That's all we need to know because that is so <laughs> true and so spot on. And if they can't find you, they can't access you. If they can't access you, you can't help them. If they can't access you and you can't help them, you can't survive as a business owner. Like it all goes round and round and it's all okay to coexist mm. together and be synchronistic. And oh, you made so many good points. I'm trying to think about what to start with. I mean, the the crack whore situation and all the comments, like <laughs> that that's very true because it, it spiraled so quickly, right? Yes. Like I have experienced that. Like I have done so much of my own therapy around my insecurities as an entrepreneur and my inability to feel like I can be successful at it because you have a bad client interaction. All of a sudden, I'm no longer a good therapist. Nobody's ever going to call me again. Um, yes. The phone's never going to ring. I have to reduce my fees from 150 to $28 an hour. Otherwise, nobody will ever, ever contact me. So it's just like, it happens that quickly. And it's like, whoa, take a breath. Like it is just about rapport and trust. And if it wasn't there, the relationship wasn't going to work in the first place. And that is really important to remember when you're starting to second guess yourself or doubt yourself as a mental health clinician or health professional. I want to think, I'm, I'm thinking about your eye doctor experience. Cause that's really like bringing something mm -hmm. up for me. You and I have talked about like this throat issue that I, I got yes. diagnosed with and I remember sitting with the expert in Appalachia in Western North Carolina, which doesn't have a lot of specialists. And he just kept talking about how many failed experiences he's had. If I want someone smarter, I should call this doctor two and a half hours away. She's way better than he is, but he's made so many mistakes that he knows what he's doing now, but it may not work. And the way he was talking about himself so arrogantly, I was just the only thing I could do. I dissociated, first of all. And all I could think about was, please remember this doctor's name in Winston-Salem. So as soon as you leave this office, you can call her and make an appointment. And she did not tell me anything differently than he did, but her delivery and her bedside manner made me trust her. And now I drive three hours away every couple months to go see her. And it's just creating that rapport and trust is so crucial in the work that we do, not just as health coaches and business coaches, but as clinicians and therapists too. And I think we often lose sight of the fact that that is what this is all about. Um, Dan, yeah, now I'm Okay, my turn. I've, I've got, I've <laughs> yes, got something. Go because our, our skills as, as particularly mental health, and, and I don't care if you're a physical therapist, an occupational therapist, a speech pathologist, where you're dealing with people's mental health all the time, right? Your, your execution might be through mobilization of joints, but you actually have to treat a person who is in pain. And you can't separate the fact that they have feelings about their pain so let's just put that out there. Okay, so the skills that we learn in terms of rapport building, in terms of how to have a conversation, in terms of social and emotional intelligence, bring me back to that point. Um, we, we are using that every time we write a letter, every time we greet somebody at the door, every time we recruit, every time we have an interaction with staff, every time we go to a community event, every time we pass through a drive through and place an order for a burger, like, these are skills that we take for granted that we are using every day. Unfortunately, health professionals put themselves in a box that goes, this is my clinical work and this is how I would present myself as a clinician. <laughs> and then we put on our clinical work face and everything changes. Yep. We go back through stages of rapport development, tick box one, you may proceed to box two. That's not how you have a conversation. Like Patrick and I didn't even, we didn't even have a formula for what we were doing here today. I just had to suck that up and go, I trust him. See, trust. And you and had this to is go, one of my most enjoyable experiences to date. So. <laughs> so, tr so if nothing else, like understanding that trust is the currency. So what are you doing to build trust? And, and it's not about just, well, I have the right pieces of paper and the right disclosures. It's like, how do you help me to make sure that I can trust you with my most vulnerable part of myself right now? Whatever that is for me. So on Monday for me, well, two days ago for me, it was my eye. Please don't come at me with that sharp implement until I know what you're going to do with it. Right? I get that you're busy. I get that you've kept me waiting 90 minutes. I will wait another 90 minutes if you need to go have a toilet break like or a, or a break just so I can trust you. Right. One of the, the pieces of um, feedback I get, I, I have um, a, a couple of communities. So I have a mastermind group called the Daring Dozen. How cool is that? And then I have a group coaching pro, uh, group coaching group <laughs> community called You the Entrepreneurial Clinician. And I am so fierce 
about protecting those communities that people just don't say shit about each other in them. They, you just don't do that around me. And if you do, we're going to have words. You can you can test me out on it, but I, I can guarantee that the community will kick you out before I have to. And that is because I have learned how to create an environment where trust is the currency. I, I, I couldn't teach you how to do that, Patrick. Like I, I haven't like I haven't codified that yet. But it it really is. People will say, I cannot believe that I talk about the things I talk about here. And I'm like, yeah, but these are the things that are keeping you stuck. Right. So I had somebody turn up this week going, I can't get my course completed. I can't, I just every time. But then she tells me I have a neurodivergent husband, two children, adult children who are neurodivergent. I work with neurodivergent kids. I'm doing lots of assessments. I'm booked out six weeks in advance. I've just been diagnosed with this other thing. And today I have a migraine. I'm like, who the hell told you to create a course? Like, <laughs> can we get some other things sorted out first? That's why people need people like Patrick and Joe, because I know creating a course is exciting about I'm not going to have to sit in a chair and see another client, but you don't understand the work that goes into that. And if you don't have the time and if you don't have the energy, more importantly, that thing ain't going to be finished. No. So I have many seen more great points. Too many therapists who have burnt out in the chair or what I call the chair come to me going, I am so burnt out. I need to create a course. And I'm like, it's not the right time. I need to help you recover from your burnout before we build a course. And I know you need to do that without losing income. So we've got some work to do. And yeah. It's possible. It's what I do. But I can't give you a formula for it because I treat every person like they're unique and they're an individual. It's not a seven-step system. We've got to work out what's right for you. That's so, <laughs> so powerful. And I agree. I mean, that's the way I approach coaching is it's got to be individualized. And maybe that person who's so burnt out needs to do some rate increases, change their populations, right? Attract clients that energize yeah. them again. Like there's so many things to go into that because so many people throw the word passive income around as if it's like very easy to do. That's one of my, uh, my like buzzwords right now that really makes me cringe. And people don't see the behind the scenes effort and energy that goes into that piece as well. And yeah, I mean, you just made so many good points. I, I just really think that even with your, your group and the thing that you said, I don't know how to codify, it's you, right? It's like you're mm. the person setting the tone, you're creating the culture. Um, it's the way you show up. It's the way that you will show up authentically and boldly. And I think that's really important because I ask myself the why me question a lot. Mm. Um, why are people attracted to me? Why does my Facebook group maybe feel different than some others that exist? But it's got to be the way that you show up for the people that are in your communities because not only are those people important to you, but those people are going to tell people about you, recommend you, et cetera. And you want good recommendations from people that you've helped and supported because their success is my success. At least that's my opinion. Mm -hmm. And I will, I will be fiercely loyal to the people that I support and vice versa. And also to the profession, you know, and I just really respect that. You just said all of that. This has been fun. <laughs> I want to keep going, but I also know you're starting your day. So, yeah. um, you know, one thing I want to say is Joe and I would not be sitting here if not for networking and the ability mm. to put myself out there or vice versa, because I messaged you a year and a half ago. Hey, do you ever want to do like a zoom chat? I had no ulterior motives. I think sometimes when we're bigger and we have more reputability, we get a lot of those asks. So it's hard mm. to discern through which have like different intentions. And I've met so many people that are so wonderful because I just put myself out there and was like, Hey, I just want to learn about you and meet you. I think our first conversation was about coffee and you trying to explain the game of cricket to me, which I still don't understand. <laughs> That's okay. <laughs> we do not have enough time for me to help you understand cricket right now. Yeah, we don't, but yeah. that is, that's been my entire experience as an entrepreneur and as a human is just to be curious yes. and to ask. And sometimes people are going to say, no, I have no desire to meet you or I don't have time. And that's okay. That's not a reflection of you, but just, 
if you are going to put yourself out there and you're struggling to make these connections, just do so with genuine intentionality and just be genuine about it. It doesn't have to be salesy or sleazy. It doesn't have to be you saying, can you help me with this? It's just, I want to get to know you as a human being, because then I am much more invested in your personal success and your business success. And that for me is the epitome of connection. And I just really appreciate the fact that we've become friends, even though we've never met each other in person. <laughs> but Hawaii is changing that in the middle of the year, which is pretty cool. That is and pretty can cool. I can I just say like when you connected with me, because you're right, I do get a lot of requests and I try my best to respond to them with grace, um, even on days when it's just like, oh, please, not again. And that, that's not anyone who's listening. What I want you to listen to is the way Patrick went about reaching out to me, which was I have no ulterior motive here. I respect you. I like you. He learned things about me. So coffee and cricket, and there's, the fact that you asked me questions about cricket was probably the clincher because I was like, I can have this conversation forever and nobody <laughs> from the US, oh, actually, that's not true. I have two clients who's, who will talk to me about the cricket, um, but nobody else, they, they just don't even know what to think. Too many people go, it's like baseball. I'm like, oh, hell no. Can we stop saying that? But the fact that you worked out that I like my coffee, that is not Starbucks. Starbucks and I'm I'm pretty militant about that and that we could have a conversation about cricket made me go I want to know this guy more so it means a lot. that's that that is and and really that's the simplicity of building connection which I think we we really need to replace the word marketing with connection yes how are we connecting with the people who need us that we can serve how are we connecting with them? If we're going to use a vehicle like social media, how are we connecting with them? Because throwing out a graphic that's got too fine a print that people are trying to read on their mobile phones is not going to cut it. Anyway. Spot on. Spot on. <laughs> we can talk all day about all this stuff. We could talk all day <laughs> about the things therapists do wrong. Maybe we'll do another episode about that. <laughs> um, but... In, in all seriousness, this was really fun. And I'm really looking forward to seeing you in Hawaii in August. And honestly, I'd love to get to Australia sometime too, to meet you in, in that country because I've never been and I really want to go. And that's even more incentive for me um, oh, to meet you always... and your husband and Smudge. <laughs> Smudge, yeah, Smudge has to come. Um, Smudge is my dog in case anybody went, what the hell is that? Because uh, my very first speaking engagement in the US, speaking to a front of a, a room full of Americans. And here in Australia, we have this phrase and it may, we go, we go bush. I'm going bush for the weekend. So I would talk about people just going bush and everybody did what you're doing right now at a conference where I was speaking at the front of the room and they all laughed. I had no clue. So I kept saying it, going bush. We're going bush. We're not going bush. What's going on? Um, and it took a lovely couple of women after, because in the end I had to say, I have no idea what you're laughing at. No idea why that's so funny, but I really do need to move on. And, and then they, they interpreted it for me and I blushed for about a week. Um, so for us, it means we're going to go into the forest and enjoy being in trees and nature. Yeah. Love, it. Love it. Smudge is a dog. Yes, <laughs> Smudge is a dog. That's cool. So uh, with all of these people doing amazing things with retreats and conferences and experiences and stuff, I mean, we can come to Australia and do that too. I just don't have the energy at the moment to be able to put one on. So if somebody wants to put their hand up and say, I'll put it on if you can help me organise it, Hey, I'm your girl. Oh, <laughs> apparently that role's already been taken and Patrick's going to make that happen. Um, excellent. We just need to wait for the Australian government to open our borders to let you in. That sounds magical. And I will happily <laughs> volunteer my time to do it as I <laughs> want to get to New Zealand to check out all my lordy, lordy, nerdy Lord of the Rings shit anyway. <laughs> so, cool. All right. Well, it's been a pleasure and please just tell everyone where they can find you because I'm sure people listening are going to want to work with someone like you. Yeah. Excellent. Well, I have a website. It's joe, J-O, Muirhead, M for Mary, U-I-R-H-E-A-D.com. Um, it's a great example of what not to do. 
So there you go. Uh, and I use, I, I've done that quite deliberately and I do that quite deliberately. Um, it has a lot of great SEO juice though. So we're not going to change. Anyway, another conversation. I'm on Facebook, uh, Jo Muir here. I'm on Instagram. I'm also on LinkedIn, but I don't like visiting LinkedIn. Um, the best way to connect with me at the moment is probably through Facebook because that's where I spend quite a lot of my time. Every uh, Friday, my time, Thursday, your time, I'm doing an Ask Me Anything live on Facebook where I'm genuinely answering questions that people ask me. Um, and once a month, I'm running a uh, low-cost masterclass on some of the, expanding on some of those points. Um, I have a the group coaching, you, you the entrepreneurial clinician is a group coaching community, um, the space in that if you want to come along and be supported to implement, you don't just get new information, I turn up to that community live three times a month, like it's That's a big investment rare. of my time. And, and my commitment is to help people implement what they learn because we're all full of head knowledge that is just, you know, sitting on dusty bookshelves in our brains and that's unhelpful. So um, that's why I, commit. I created the group because people needed a more cost-effective way of accessing coaching and, and this works for both of us. So um, it's pretty cool, called You, the Entrepreneurial Clinician. There you go. Perfect. And we will have the links to all of that in the show notes. So if anyone needs that information, you'll have it. And again, I just want to thank you for coming on and making time. And it's just been a pleasure. And I'm, I'm really looking forward to continuing to connect. Um, for everyone listening, new episodes of the All Things Private Practice podcast every Monday on all major platforms like download, subscribe, share. And new motto is doubt yourself, do it anyway. We will see you next Monday. Thanks, Joe.